rage, fear, grief, lust, care, seeking, and play. These seven basic emotions are each produced by a separate neural circuit in the brain, at least according to the late neuroscientist Jak Pongsep, one of the most influential neuroscientists in recent times. He argued that each of these seven emotions had a dedicated system in the subcortical regions of the brains of mammals. What you might notice about this table is that all of the primary process emotional systems involve the periaqueductal gray, and they also have their own neurochemistries. Now, we're not gonna really go into the neurochemistry here, but I just wanna note that the periaqueductal gray seems to be the central node in all of these basic emotional systems. By activating these particular regions, you can produce a specific and intense emotional experience. The rage system, for example, goes from particular areas of the periaqueductal gray, or a PAG, to the medial hypothalamus, and finally to the medial amygdala. If you were to place an electrode in a mammal's brain and stimulate these specific regions, you would observe a violent reaction. The animal would try to attack whatever is in front of it, becoming increasingly aggressive as you turned up the stimulation. If I were to stimulate your brain in this way, according to Pongsep, you would likely clench your jaw and feel very angry. In this video, I'm going to explain each of these seven systems, including their basic neuroanatomy, and what happens when they're stimulated, according to Pongsep. But first, a very important caveat. The study of emotions is an unsettled area of psychology and neuroscience, and there are many schools of thought that disagree on fundamental questions including the definition of emotion. So just remember that Pongsep's perspective represents one among many, pretty much all emotion scientists agree to varying extents that our upbringing, life history, and relationships, as well as our social, cultural, and economic environments affect our emotions. The problem is that the different schools of thought disagree about how that happens in the brain and what it means. For Pongsepian affective neuroscience, Emotions play out on three levels. The first, called primary process emotional systems, are the neural circuits in the subcortical brain regions that I'll be talking about in this video. These produce what are called primal affects, which are defined by having a pleasant or aversive subjective quality and by driving the animal to either approach or avoid objects or situations. These primal affects then feed into a learning process where the brain learns that various objects and aspects of the environment will trigger one or more of the primary process systems. So for example, say a mouse is running around in your basement and finds some cheese sitting on a mouse trap. It walks over and tries to snatch the cheese, which triggers the trap. Thanks to his quick reaction time, the mouse manages to escape the metal bar as it snaps down, except that it briefly clamps on his tail, causing a burst of pain. This triggers his fear system, urging him to run away. That's the primary process level. But the next time this mouse encounters a cheese-laden trap, he will be afraid, and he may even freeze or get away from it. That's the secondary level, a simple learning process. In this case, the activation of the fear system triggered the amygdala to form a fear memory. And if you want to learn more about fear conditioning in particular, check out my video on it. Finally, the tertiary level may be the most relevant for mammals with big cerebral cortices, especially humans. In a 2012 interview with Discover Magazine, Pongsep explained, quote, the tertiary level is programmed by life experiences through the neocortex, engendering our higher cognitive processes such as thinking, ruminating, and planning. So that's how our memories, knowledge, and life experience, and our cultural context can deeply affect our emotional dispositions. The tertiary level is where emotional regulation takes place, especially through our prefrontal cortex and the related networks. Now that we understand the three levels, let's look at each of the primary process emotional systems, starting with the unpleasant emotions. Okay, so earlier we talked about the rage system, noting that if I were to stimulate particular areas of the periaqueductal gray, which is in the brainstem, the medial hypothalamus or the medial amygdala in your brain, you would suddenly become really angry, clenching your teeth, and you'd get more and more furious as I increase the stimulation. The fear system involves similar brain regions as the rage system. Specifically, it encompasses a neural circuit that runs through the nuclei of the central amygdala, the anterior and medial hypothalamus, and the dorsal PAG. According to Pongsep, stimulating this system in humans results in feelings of intense fear, 
In his 2012 book co-authored with Lucy Biven called The Archaeology of Mind, they quote a study from the 1960s in which one participant said simply, I'm scared to death. Now, it probably goes without saying, but people do not enjoy this kind of stimulation. Okay, next up is the grief system. Now, this is the last of the negative primary process emotions we'll consider. And as highly social mammals, we have an intimate understanding of grief. At some point in our lives, we'll lose someone we love and grief will follow. This may be true for other social mammals as well, including dogs, cats, apes, elephants, and dolphins, among others. Brain regions in the grief system include the preoptic area of the hypothalamus, the dorsal medial thalamus, and the periaqueductal gray. This brain system activates in rat pups when their mother is away, and it seems to produce the separation distress vocalizations, a distinct kind of yelping that helps to lure mom back to the home. In some studies of humans, a similar network of regions has been shown to activate when study participants were very sad. Though it should be noted that the network observed in humans included more cortical regions, such as the ACC and insula, and it's not quite clear if the same collection of subcortical nuclei are involved. Okay, so that sums up the negative emotion systems. So let's go to the positive ones. First is the lust system, which is composed of what Panksepp called sexual arousal circuits. As you might expect, this system differs somewhat between males and females. For male humans, the most important brain area is the interstitial nuclei of the anterior hypothalamus. Damage to this region in young rats reduces their sexual urges. For females, the corresponding brain region is the ventral medial hypothalamus. Now in males, the most important molecules are testosterone and vasopressin. In females, the corresponding hormones are estrogen, progesterone, and oxytocin. Now it may seem like these are totally different brain regions and molecules, but these differences notwithstanding, Pongsep and his co-author Biven noted in the Archaeology of Mind that, quote, the brains of each sex contain residual sexual circuits typical of the opposite sex. So vasopressin circuits are found in the brains of females in smaller abundance, and oxytocin circuits exist in male brains, but in smaller abundance. Because of this overlap, it's possible that individual differences in these systems contribute to sexual preference and gender identity. All right, next is the care system. The importance of caring nurturance was summed up by Pongsep when he wrote, quote, mammals would not exist on the face of the earth unless their brains and bodies were prepared to invest enormous time and energy in the care of their offspring, who simply could not survive without such devotion. Interestingly, Pongsep suggested that the care system was closely related to the grief and lust systems. With grief, when rodent pups produce the separation distress vocalizations we mentioned earlier, it triggers their mother to return to the nest and care for the pups. Now, care's relationship with the lust system may seem strange, but consider the idea that lust is partly responsible for the strong, sometimes lifelong bonds between mating mammals. An intriguing idea is that oxytocin is a key molecule for sexuality and maternal care. Panksepp and Biven write, quote, because of the shared neurochemistries, we should not ignore the controversial possibility that maternal care emerged over the long course of mammalian brain evolution, in part from the pre-existing brain mechanisms and affects of female lust. All right, two more systems to go. Next is the play system. Children love to play, and most adults do too. For children, play seems to be not just about making friends or having fun, but also about preparing them for social life in adulthood. Play seems to help children develop social norms, deal with conflict, limit their aggression, and form a healthy sense of competition. In adults, this system may partially underlie some of the more abstract ways that we have fun, like when we tell friendly jokes at each other's expense. Still, the neuroanatomical and chemical details have not been worked out yet. However, Pongsep and Biven note that play appears to be crucial for healthy childhood brain development. Regardless, the play system seems to rely on some of the circuits we've already mentioned, and especially on the final system the seeking system. The seeking system can be considered the main primary process emotional system. This system is intertwined with the others in the sense that whatever behaviors or attitudes the other systems may initiate, it is ultimately the seeking system that drives us to act. In humans, the basal ganglia, particularly the ventral striatum, 
is involved in the anticipation and evaluation of reward, while the ventral tegmental area is responsible for the release of dopamine during reward processing. In many ways, this system is about motivation and learning. As you might expect, this system is critical for rewarding social activities like play, mating, and nurturance. However, this barely scratches the surface of how this system works. And if you wanna learn more about this, in addition to several videos I've made about dopamine, motivation, and pleasure on my channel, Taylor Guthrie and I recently discussed this on an episode of the Social Brain Podcast, so check that out if you're interested. So that wraps up this brief overview of the primary process emotion systems posited by Yank Pongsep. As I mentioned, however, this neuroscientific view of emotions is not the only one. In the next video, we'll see a fundamentally different perspective on the nature of emotions, that of neuroscientist Lisa Feldman Barrett. All right, thanks so much for watching this episode. Now, don't forget to like and subscribe. And also, if you get anything out of this channel, please consider becoming a patron by going to patreon.com slash sense of mind. You'll get exclusive access to monthly live streams and a written blog post version of every new video from Sense of Mind, including this one. This channel is now 100% dependent on viewers like you, as well as ad revenue, so your support is needed now more than ever. Finally, if you want to stay up to date with Sense of Mind, sign up for the newsletter at senseofmindshow.com newsletter. Thanks again. I'll catch you next time.